Welcome to our special Giving Tuesday presentation, uh, Preservation Across the Nation. Um, we hope you'll celebrate Giving Tuesday with the gift of archaeological heritage, and we'll be providing the link for the donation, uh, online donations in the comments and in the chat on Zoom. So I'd like to get started by um, introducing our Southwest Regional Director, Jim Walker. Jim? Hi, how are you? Great. Welcome everyone to the Archaeological Conservancy's Giving Tuesday program. And uh, it is such a pleasure to be able to meet with our donors and our members and to thank them personally for everything they've done for the Conservancy over the last year. Uh, you know, we uh, are a group of uh, professionals. Uh, we do a very good job in acquiring sites, but without the funds to buy them and to fund our operations, uh, we're just twiddling our thumbs here. And so we owe our success to our donors. And uh, in this program, we're going to tell you a little bit about how we operate, who we are, and, uh, and at the same time, thank you for your continued support of the Archaeological Conservancy. Uh, the, uh, we have a number of people with us today. Uh, we have some regional directors. We have some uh, field representatives. Uh, and we have some people from the main office. And so uh, we'll be uh, talking to you a little bit about what we do. One of the things that we'd like to do uh, in the very beginning is we have about a 10 minute video that explains what happens after we buy an archeological preserve. Uh, acquiring the archeological preserve is just the first step. Uh, whether it's a donation or a purchase, uh, it's certainly one of the biggest steps that we take. But there are many other actions that are really required to put in place uh, our program of preservation and uh, long-term stewardship. And so, uh, April, if, uh, if you're ready, why don't we watch this short video? You'll learn a little bit more about what we do. Thank you. The Archaeological Conservancy is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the acquisition and management of significant archaeological and historical sites located on private land. Over the past 41 years, we've established 550 archaeological preserves in 46 states. We greatly appreciate the assistance from our members and the help that it's given us through the years. This brief discussion explains how we use those funds to accomplish our preservation goals. The first and usually largest expense incurred in creating a preserve is the cost of acquiring the land. We rely heavily on foundations, corporations, and large donors to fund land acquisition. Acquiring a property is just the first in a series of subsequent steps we take to create an archaeological preserve. We rely on donations from our members to fund the steps that follow the initial acquisition. Those steps include fencing. It's very important to fence archaeological preserves, not only to deter trespassers, but also to prosecute looters. Most courts, especially in the western U.S., will not convict individuals for trespassing, property damage, or looting unless that individual has crossed a perimeter fence marked no trespassing. Fences usually cost between $3 and $8 a linear foot, depending on where they're being built and what type of fence is being constructed. We normally use five-strand barbed wire fences with T-posts on 20-foot centers. We use barbed wire in rural areas where cows are present and smooth wire in urban areas. Some preserves we acquire are already fenced. Some require a minimal amount of new fencing. Many require a new perimeter fence. A fencing project can run from a few hundred to tens of thousands of dollars. Creating a management plan. 
We create a management plan for all new preserves. The plan is created by a committee, which includes the former landowner, adjacent landowners, archaeologists, descendant community members such as Native Americans. The meeting is usually a one-day event that is held in a meeting room near the preserve. It includes a morning visit by the committee to the site followed by an afternoon discussion. The plan is not a consensus document, but instead it represents a forum of ideas about managing the preserve. Topics covered include access to the preserve by archaeologists, access to the preserve by the public, access to the preserve by descendant community members, ground cover, erosion control, along with any other issues mentioned by the participants in the meeting. The plan is then made available to Conservancy board members to be considered whenever important decisions about the preserve need to be made. The average management plan usually runs about two to five thousand dollars depending on travel expenses. The management plan can be revised, expanded, or amended if circumstances of the preserve change. Site stewards. The Conservancy recruits volunteer site stewards to assist us in watching over our preserves and to conduct tours of the preserves. These are usually neighbors or local avocational archaeologists who are interested in preservation. Several states in the Southwest region, including Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, and Utah, have statewide volunteer site steward programs that the Conservancy partners with. We often train our site stewards about the archaeology at the preserve. They protect and offer them handouts, photos, and maps that they can use to explain the significance and history of the preserve to visitors. Once the stewards have been selected and trained, the cost of managing the site steward program is minimal. Educational opportunities. We like for our preserves to be used by the public. The photo shows archaeologist Carol Patterson giving a tour to a group on the Conservancy's Chavanaugh Petroglyph Preserve near Montrose, Colorado, featuring Ute petroglyphs. We do our best to offer tours on demand to school groups, archaeological interest groups, and the public, usually led by an archaeological expert. Again, on an established preserve, the cost of extending educational opportunities is usually minimal. Mapping. Most of the preserves we acquire lack an adequate archaeological map. Maps are an important planning tool for identifying areas that need backfilling, reseeding, or where standing walls need stabilization. We invite archaeology students as well as interested avocational archaeologists to practice their mapping schools on our preserves. We also hire professionals to map our preserves using traditional mapping techniques as well as LIDAR. Professionals who specialize in mapping often donate their services to the Conservancy. Backfilling. Sites that have been looted using mechanical equipment should be backfilled to protect the remaining intact deposits. If a looted masonry room is left unbackfilled, surrounded by intact deposits, through time the four walls of the vacant room will collapse, corrupting the archaeological integrity of the intact adjacent rooms. The photos show the Box S Pueblo in western New Mexico, adjacent to the Zuni Reservation. It represents a proto-Zuni site occupied between A.D. 1260 and 1280. Out of the 1,100 rooms in the Pueblo, 110 had been looted with a backhoe. Since the Pueblo was two stories high, many of the shafts created by the looter were 20 feet deep and the depth and width of a Pueblo room, about 8 feet by 10 feet. 
After mapping the site with the assistance of Zuni archaeologists, tribal members, and volunteer conservancy members, we backfilled all 110 looted rooms over a three-week period. This project cost just under $20,000. This 160-acre preserve was transferred to Zuni Pueblo in 2000. Stabilization. The man in this photo works for Salomon Ruins Museum Division of Contract Archaeology in Bloomfield, New Mexico, as part of an award-winning professional stabilization team. The Conservancy hired the Salomon Ruins team in 2013 to stabilize Garcia Canyon Pueblito, a nine-room gubernador phase Navajo structure built in a remote area of northwest New Mexico between A.D. 1712 and 1722, built atop a boulder 70 feet above Francis Canyon, Garcia Canyon Pueblito provided a defensive refuge for a Navajo family, protecting them from retaliatory Spanish expeditions and Ute and Comanche raids during a difficult time of conflict and unrest in the Southwest. The stabilization project cost 64000 with 40000 provided by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. Revegetation. In the arid southwest, adequate ground cover is vital to preventing erosion as well as discouraging invasive species of shrubs and grasses. This is the 196-acre Smith Family Petroglyph Preserve in Utah County, Utah. Revegetation of a half mile long section of the preserve with native grasses was necessary after a devastating wildfire swept through the preserve in 2020. The revegetation project cost the Conservancy about $16,000. Interpretation. The Conservancy encourages use and visitation of our preserves. This interpretive kiosk at the Smith Family Petroglyph Preserve was completed in 2019 using volunteer labor at a cost of $3,000. The $3,000 was generously provided by the Utah Department of Transportation. That is just a, a short example of some of the projects that are done after acquisition and we certainly, again, appreciate the contributions that have been made to the Conservancy by our members, which help us accomplish these important steps. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, that's a, a very interesting step back in time <laughs> uh, to see some of our older preserves and uh, how we operate as an organization. Uh, what we would like to do is uh, go to some of the staff people that we have with us today and uh, sort of go through some of the projects, new projects that they're working on so you can see what we've been up to lately. Uh, you know, it has been a tough year, I'll tell you. And uh, it's been very difficult uh, for us to operate. However, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have done, I think, an outstanding job of continuing our nationwide program of preserving and protecting archeological sites. Many of our staff members uh, already work from home. Uh, some of the people in the uh, national headquarters in Albuquerque, including me, uh, had the experience of working from home for the first time uh, quite a bit over the last year and a half. And uh, it, it has been very interesting. What I have learned uh, is that 
I can do almost as much at home as I can in the office. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the pandemic has taught us new ways to innovate, new ways to connect with people, and uh, new ways to move ahead uh, with our work of preserving and protecting archaeological sites. And so that, that being said, uh, we would like to show you a few examples. And if, if you don't mind, I'll start first. And uh, I have a screen that I'd like to share with you. I have two interesting sites to tell you about. This is what we're working on uh, right now. And so I'm going to open a PowerPoint. What I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about one of our new projects in Southwestern Colorado. And this is Shields Pueblo. You can see the star uh, up here in, oops, sorry about that. Keep going back to, okay. There is a star in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, the town in the lower right-hand corner is Cortez, Colorado. And we're in the Montezuma Valley. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, a lot of us, whenever we think about southwestern Colorado, think about Mesa Verde. And I'm sure many of you have been to Mesa Verde and admired the amazing cliff dwellings that were there. Uh, you know, about a thousand years ago, uh, there were probably 2,000 or more people living in the area that is now designated as Mesa Verde National Park. Uh, at the same time, there were about 20,000 people living in the Montezuma Valley around Cortez. And the Conservancy has taken advantage of this incredible concentration of archaeological sites. Uh, and we actually have 16 Conservancy preserves acquired between 1982 and now in the Montezuma Valley in uh, Montezuma and Dolores counties. And so Shields Pueblo is a, a really unique uh, resource. Uh, it is adjacent, and we'll finally get to the slide that I keep popping off of. Shields Pueblo is in blue on your screen, and you'll notice there is a brown section below it that says NPS. Uh, this is one of the units of Hovenweep National Monument. And we are in an area of very high archeological density. And so Shields Pueblo is a unique site. It was discovered uh, quite some time ago. And uh, one of the early discoveries made at Shields was one of the first copper bells ever found in the Southwest. And uh, it had the distinction of being the northernmost copper bell found. Uh, these copper bells were coming from uh, basically the west coast of Mexico. Uh, you know, you're, you may be thinking about a church bell, but no, the copper bells think more like a, a jingle bell uh, made out of copper with perhaps a stone or a piece of copper inside it. And so, uh, Shields Pueblo is huge. It is just massive. It is about 40 acres of land. That's what's in the blue. And there it is. This is an archaeological map of the work that's been done at Shields Pueblo. And these excavation units have been excavated by both Colorado College uh, in 1973 to 1977. Uh, and also, I should say, Colorado Mountain College. Uh, there were excavations done there by Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Southwest Colorado, one of our partners in Montezuma County uh, between 1997 and 2000. Despite the excavations that have been done by these two entities, uh, there are still extensive undisturbed deposits that remain at Shields. Uh, this particular property is owned by an institution. It probably has a market value of around 250,000. Uh, we are in the process of negotiating a bargain sale to charity, which would be part cash, part donation to the conservancy. 
And uh, we are hoping to acquire this for probably around $50,000. Uh, it's going to require a perimeter fence, perimeter fence around a 40 acre tract is going to run us about $15,000 to $20,000. We'll also be de developing a management plan for the site, maybe another five. And so uh, that will be our budget. We're going to uh, try traditional uh, foundation fundraising and fundraising from our members in Colorado and nationwide to acquire this. And so keep your eyes out for Shields Pueblo because it's upcoming. Uh, the next site I'd like to talk about is in Socorro County, New Mexico. That's the area shown in red on this state map of New Mexico. You'll see an arrow pointing to the small abandoned mining town of Riley. And Riley was a spot along the railroad and it was uh, right along an occasional stream called the Rio Salado. Uh, Riley was occupied between 1900 and 1920. And so there is a subdivision that was put in adjacent to the ghost town of Riley, what is now a ghost town today. And here is the site. And uh, on the right, is one of our newest employees. Uh, this is Shelby McGee, who is the new Southwest field representative. And we're looking at part of this site. Uh, it's on a 20 acre tract of land. It's got several masonry and adobe architectural units. Uh, there are visible mounds and midden areas. And all of that covers about five acres of the 20 acre site. The historic period occupation uh, consists of masonry house foundations, corrals, uh, low standing adobe walls. And that's what you're seeing in this picture. You're seeing some low standing adobe walls. And all of that was associated with the small agricultural and mining town of Riley. Uh, and so those would date from about 1900 to 1920. Uh, we also have uh, another two more occupations represented uh, Pueblo one and Pueblo two period uh, sites that are on this. Uh, those sites date from about 8650 to 1150. Uh, and uh, they are represented as low mounds with uh, uh, artifact scatters around them. And so this was obviously a favored place to live through history beginning in prehistoric times. So this is happily a donation from one of our members. And uh, the member is a professional archeologist. Uh, he uh, was the person who did the required survey work for the subdivision when it was first established. He realized that this incredible lot was covered with archaeology and he decided to buy it for permanent preservation. He's held it for a number of years and he's now made the decision to donate the site to the Conservancy. We have a signed donation agreement for this. And so those are the two projects that I have to talk about and what I'm going to do is uh, turn this over to Jessica Crawford, who is our Southeast Regional Representative, and let her tell you about some of the things that have been happening in her region. Jessica. Can you see my screen? You can. Yes, we can see it. Um, let's see. And I Okay, and I'm unmuted, good. Um, it's been a busy year for Nikki Matson, who is my field representative, who is here also. I was hoping she would show herself so she could wave, but, but she's here also. We've been busy with a lot of projects, but there she is. <laughs> she's just in the next room, actually. 
Um, we've been busy with projects that include site maintenance, a uh, little bit of research on conservancy sites in the Southeast this year, but not as much as usual for obvious reasons because of COVID. And of course, we've had lots of maintenance issues, uh, unfortunately travel during part of the year. You know, we, we didn't travel much during most of the first part of the year. So we didn't, we're still catching up on that. We, we have a lot to do there. I thought people would like to see uh, what the Southeast region looks like for the Conservancy. Um, yes, I, I know South Carolina looks kind of bare right now, but I do have some potential acquisitions um, that have been suggested to me lately. So I have some new South Carolina files, but South Carolina people, um, you know, let us know if you have any suggestions. I'm, I'm always up for uh, new potential acquisitions. Uh, we've been busy with trying to add to sites that we already own, like Troyville site in Louisiana and Holy Ground in Alabama. We have, we'll probably get two additional parcels of both of those sites soon. And we've also been looking at uh, new sites as well. In fact, tomorrow, Nikki and I are going to see uh, what we call Taylor Mounds, which is probably, it's actually actually one mound site. It's probably about 45 minutes from my office here in Northeast Mississippi. And then we're going to a preserve that the Conservancy already owns called the Blanchard Harris Mound site to deal with some, uh, I guess, uh, vandalism issues that keep occurring there. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything every day. Um, I'll just, I'll just briefly talk about two other new acquisitions that um, we don't have anything signed on yet, but I hopefully will be really close soon. Uh, let's see, it's not, it's not advancing. <laughs> well, I can't, it, for some reason it's not moving. Bar, Jessica, if you hit your oh. space bar, it might. Ah, here's, there we go. It's uh, the Gulf Shores Canal, which is in Gulf Shores, Alabama. This is really one of the, one of the most interesting sites I've ever seen. Certainly it, it's unique to the, the Southeast. I mean, we, there are canals in the Southeast and canoe canals, things like that, uh, mostly in Florida. Um, this one in Gulf Shores, Alabama is there are several parts of it that need to be preserved. Um, you can see in the LIDAR image where some of it is, it's really visible. Uh, this whole canal has different landowners and we're contacting as many as we can. Um, some have been responsive, others have not, but this is, it's such a unique feature and it's an unusual site that it's, I think it's something that we need to really try hard to acquire. And you know, if, if, we, if we can just get one landowner to, to agree to sign an agreement with us, I'll, I'll be tickled and then hopefully we can get more of it. Um, it's it's a, woodland, a woodland canal and it's just, it's really one of the most interesting sites that I've had the pleasure of seeing. And, you know, just keep your fingers crossed. This is one that we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to get, get with some landowners on. All right. And let's see, this is another one, which is uh, White's Creek, also called Marshall Farm. It's near Nashville, Tennessee, and it's multi-component. It has a little bit of everything on it from early archaic to Mississippian period. Um, it's in an area that is, is, it's in a lot of danger from being developed. This is, it's farmed right now. Um, this site was suggested to me by my friends at TVAR, um, their CRM firm in the area. and. They did some work out there and thought, you know, this is this is something that really needs to be preserved and and could potentially be in danger if if a landowner who is not worried or concerned about the archaeology there ends up with it. And and we are trying to work out something with this landowner. He does recognize the importance of of the site he has there. Um, it's it's farmed right now, but it is right on the outskirts of Nashville and it's where people are buying these large tracts of land and, and building big fancy houses. Um, I think they said Kid Rock lives right on the other side of this hill out there. So it's a beautiful place and, and hopefully you know, the Conservancy will end up with this piece of property and it'll will stay beautiful, it will remain a green space. Um, one other site that I should have mentioned earlier, uh, the Oswald site, and we just signed a purchase, an option 
to purchase uh, for $190,000. That's in South Mississippi in Jackson County. And it's a great site. It's a National Register eligible site. It's multi-component. And it was one that was evaluated by FEMA after Hurricane Katrina. And it's 44 acres. I mean, it's a huge site. And there's a lot of archaeology there. It's probably, it's well, it's definitely the most expensive I've purchased in a long time. Um, so we've applied for a $50,000 grant that hopefully we'll get, but that's still, you know, it's the prospect of having to raise that amount of money is kind of daunting, but it's, it is, it's an important site and, and really you know, it's, it can shed a light, shed light on a lot of, a lot of archeology span that we aren't, don't know much about in that part of Mississippi and the Southeast. So I'm, I'm excited that we do have a purchase option signed on that. And, um, you know, that's about it. If anybody has any questions, you can be happy. To, I'll be happy to respond to an email or a call. And thank you so much for your support throughout the year. Um, thank you for taking our tours, for watching our lectures, for uh, sending us emails and suggesting sites to us. It's you know, it's when it when it gets hard. That's always that always helps. I appreciate it. And uh, who's next, April? I guess would that be Kelly? Yeah, Kelly is next. You can stop sharing your screen okay. and we'll move it on to Kelly. No, no. No, okay. <laughs> no you're just going to leave it out. <laughs> okay, I'll be Yeah, back. Just, just look at my pictures while Kelly. Yeah. They're good. <laughs> All right. Let's see how I do here. Okay. All right. Does everyone see that and hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Kelly Berliner. I'm the Eastern Regional Director for the Conservancy. And just thank you all so much for joining us today. We don't always get a chance to interface with our members on such a broad scale. So it's a silver lining of COVID to be able to connect with you guys digitally. So thanks so much. And I'll spend just a little bit of time today highlighting four projects here in the Eastern region, either that we've recently wrapped up or that are ongoing um, to give you a little peek at what's going on here. And so if you're not familiar with the breakdown of our regions, um, here it roughly is. The Eastern region is Maine down through North Carolina, including part of West Virginia. And this is a rough breakdown of the location of those archeological preserves we have here in the east. So I think we're up to just over 70 now, kind of scattered throughout a couple spots here and there, but working to fill those in. And uh, much like the other directors have said, you know, all of these sites have maintenance needs. We can't just acquire them and walk away. So a lot of my time is spent zipping around between these places to make sure fences are in order or properties are posted or that our site stewards are keeping an eye on things. And so um, it's the smallest region, but it's still enough to cover. And so today I wanted to highlight uh, two, four projects. Two of them are prehistoric and two of them are historic. We get a great diversity of sites here in the East. And the first project is Flint Mine Hill. So this is located uh, in the Hudson Valley in New York state. And this site goes back, goodness, over 10,000 years ago, up through the woodland period. It's a tremendous chert quarry site. So just really, really impressive place. Uh, I know the map's a little bit hard to see here, but this was a sketch done by Arthur Parker, who was an archeologist with the New York State Museum. Of course, a site of this size, I mean, this is a hill that's around, oh gosh, 65 acres in size. So just tremendous outcropping of chert. You know, a lot of the locals knew about it. They were taking boxes of artifacts into the museum and Parker thought it might be worthwhile to take a look. And sure enough, this entire, well, Flint Mine Hill kind of gives it away. It's an entire, uh, the entire hill is a chert quarry. So huge processing areas for lithics, people coming and going. And what it looks like in real life is this. So you can see you kind of ascend up onto the site. It's somewhat overgrown. Um, and I, I know it's really tough to see these quarries in the Eastern region, but here's a big pit that goes down. And so you can still see evidence of these uh, long quarrying activities that took place here over thousands of years. And if you look down, the entire site is just absolutely covered in quarrying debris. I think 
the way Parker described it was a bit fanciful. He said the number of hammer stones would like fill a, a railroad, numerous railroad cars or something of that nature. So a lot of potential to better understand uh, trade networks here because this material is moving out from this area quite a distance. People are coming into the area. They're doing primary reduction. So they're kind of rough shaping tools and then heading away from this site down into the surrounding valleys. So fabulous site. It's been on our radar. And that's something I always like to highlight. You know, at the Conservancy, we revisit these sites for years and years and years. I mean, even decades, we just kind of have them on our radar saying, wow, we should really get that one day when ownership changes or when attitudes change, whatever it is. And so this is one of those. And it was owned by an archeological uh, chapter, a chapter of the New York State Archeological Association. And they took great care of the site, but it just, it's not near their location, which is on Long Island. And so they wanted a permanent home for it. We couldn't quite reach an agreement. They had their needs, we had ours. And then lo and behold, several years later, uh, a company called Flint Mine Solar entered the picture and wanted to put in a large solar panel facility right outside of Coxsackie, very close to the Flint Mine Hill site. And so their project was going to have a pretty substantial impact on some archaeological resources, not only installing the solar panels, but the additional facilities and support structure. And so working with the Conservancy, the archaeological chapter, and the state, they said, well, could we do creative mitigation? Could we acquire Flint Mine Hill, an incredibly important archaeological site, and donate it to offset some of our impact to these other archaeological resources? And well, we thought, the Conservancy thought that was a great idea, and the state agreed. So they were able to put up the funds to purchase this site and then donate it to the Conservancy. And we just closed on this, I guess about two weeks ago now. And so it's been you know, a almost 10 year project just for that final phase. And I'm just really excited about this. Um, it's a great example for the types of mitigation that can take place for these large scale development projects. So I hope it serves as a model for other similar projects in this area, especially we're seeing a lot more solar panel development in the East. Um, I know it's, quite prevalent in the West, but it's a bit new for us out here still. So very excited about that one. Uh, briefly, we're going to hop down to the great state of West Virginia. So heading Southwest from there to highlight another site that again was on our radar. I think our Midwest worked on the region, worked on this site. I've worked on this site. We really, really wanted to get this village site. Um, it's a Fort Ancient village site. Uh, towards the end of uh, the Fort Ancient culture period. So dating around to 1400, AD 1400 to 1450, and just a tremendous site to preserve. Excellent preservation here. It's right on the New River. I know it's really tough to see in the photo, um, but if you look kind of down, we're standing at the edge of the village looking down into the New River. And so what makes this site really fascinating is that it's right at the southern edge of the Fort Ancient cultural sphere. And I won't go into a whole lot of detail about um, how that's defined. Definitely check it out if you're interested. Uh, but for archaeologists, it's kind of at this point where we're starting to see elements from other areas coming in. So we're starting to see cultures that are associated with southwestern Virginia, so Radford style ceramics and so on, start to intermix with Fort Ancient cultural elements here. And so something interesting is going on. You know, people might be coming in or they're trading. We don't really know. But making sure that we preserve this site to hopefully understand that a little better was a very large priority for us. And it doesn't hurt that it's an absolutely beautiful site. Uh, really wonderful. The maintenance needs here, fortunately, are pretty minimal, but we will have to keep this mode. And so that is an ongoing need, and we'll have to monitor it as well for looting um, and other issues like that. Now, a lot of what we know about this site, I like to give a shout out to David First here. He's an archaeologist with the New River Gorge National Park. He's done excellent work uh, working with students from the University of Kentucky on identifying features on this site through a magnetometer survey that showed that there's really wonderful preservation. It's a very deeply stratified site. You can see that in the profiles here of this test unit. 
in great preservation. So wonderful botanicals, uh, carbonized corn cobs that were used to date the site, as well as other elements. So again, you know, this is the site that we've been contacting the property owners for years and years, and it was only, gosh, I guess it was, it was a little tough. It was right during the height of COVID that I was trying to find a way to meet with this property owner out at the site and do it safely. And we were able to do that. And he finally said, you know what, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm willing to sell you part of it. And so uh, persistence is a big component of trying to keep after these sites. So he was willing to sell that to us at a reasonable price. And um, we've had to do some fundraising for that, but very happy to say that it's now preserved. And here's an example of some of those uh, ceramics from the site there. So, okay, I'm gonna fast forward in time quite a bit here to two interesting historic sites, one that we're about to acquire and one that we're still kind of in early phases, just to give you a sample of um, other projects here. This site in Connecticut, the New England Hebrew Farmers of the Emanuel Society Synagogue and Creamery site is a bit of a mouthful but it's a really great name because it essentially describes what the site is. Uh, so this is a Jewish settlement site dating to around 1850, give or take, um, and being occupied up until the mid 20th century. And I just think this site is really fabulous because it's a bit different, uh, at least in the Eastern region. And a nice thing about historic sites is that when they date this late, sometimes you're lucky enough to get photographs, which a lot of archeologists, we don't get that very often. And so we can see uh, the synagogue on the left is uh, as it was standing, the town was no longer occupied at this time. The synagogue was not being used, but it was still standing. It was still standing after a fire in 1972, uh, but it did eventually fall into ruin. And this is what it looks like today. So there's a memorial marking the site of the synagogue and there's a foundation outline. And a really, really wonderful element of this project is that the site is owned by the New England Hebrew Farmers of the Emanuel Society uh, group. It's a nonprofit group consisting pr predominantly of a descendant community who had ancestors at this site. And they're so passionate about preserving this history, about working with the conservancy. And it's been really incredibly rewarding um, to have those shared values. And so they understand that they're a smaller group. Um, it might be beneficial to have an archeological preservation group, make sure that this is preserved in perpetuity. And, and we agree, we think that's a great idea. And so there's been a bit of excavation on the site. This is uh, some of the work that was done. It was led by Nick Bellantoni, the former state archeologist of Connecticut here in the synagogue. And you can see a sample of some of the artifacts. So this was some of the glass that would have been in an Oculus window in the synagogue there. And then there's also been work on another component of this site. So this is the Shulhitz house, or this would have been a ritual butcher. And there's also a mikvah. Here's some of the excavation of that mikvah. So the mikvah was a ritual bath used by um, the Jewish community. And so I think this site is just really wonderful in terms of expanding the diversity of sites we're looking at at the Conservancy, because here we're seeing um, an early immigrant experience, a community that was divine, defining itself uh, in response to its surrounding community, but also trying to determine how they interacted with that surrounding community um, in terms of maintaining certain rituals and so on. So this has been a very rewarding project. We had a ceremony just last month. Again, it was super delayed due to COVID, but we finally had a ceremony with the descendant community to sign a donation agreement to um, ultimately close on this property, hopefully in January. So really wonderful project. I'm really excited about that. And then just to close out here, I'll move a little quickly. Um, a project we have on the horizon that's going to need a bit of fundraising is a site called the Egg Mountain Settlement Site. So we're in southwestern Vermont. It's um, pretty isolated. And this is a small rural village, uh, probably a subsistence type economy dating to the late 1700s up until about 1820. And so two things I want to highlight about this project is that this site is it's a time capsule. You know, these foundations, these stone foundations, they're located up on the side of a mountain. 
the local community has known about them, but they've really just been untouched since 1820, 1830 or so when the population left. So there's wonderful preservation of a very particular time period. And um, it wasn't even Vermont for that whole period. It was the Vermont Republic. It wasn't yet a state for part of that. So really a great glimpse into understanding these early subsistence economies and figuring out what their role was um, in the formation of the state and in connection to other communities. And another very interesting element is that this is very likely the spot where Daniel Shays fled after leading an uprising in Massachusetts. So uh, Daniel Shays was um, an individual, he was a farmer, he was a Revolutionary War veteran who led an uprising in Massachusetts following the war um, to protest debt, to collecting of debt from farmers and high taxes and ultimately uh, led a group of Shea sites to attack the Springfield Armory. He was not successful in this endeavor, but his actions were discussed at the First Continental Congress, so they did reverberate pretty, um, pretty seriously. And then he had to flee Massachusetts, of course. Uh, he wanted to protect himself as well as his family after the uprising failed. And archival and deed research really strongly suggests that he fled to the Sandgate area and probably the settlement on Egg Mountain. So just a very important historical character and a really interesting part of uh, potentially of this site. And you can see some of what we're dealing with here. This is a large um, stone foundation. And here's Jess Robinson, state archeologist of Vermont, visiting the site up there with us. And so it's kind of a scattered settlement across this mountainside. And again, it's just really wonderful preservation. And a lot of what we know about the site archeologically comes from a gentleman named Stephen Butts. He's in the top image there on the left. And he teaches classes in upstate New York, uh, became very interested in the story of Daniel Shays and started bringing students out here and teaching them how to map these sites. Uh, he's an amateur archeologist, They've done very, very wonderful work in kind of bringing this story to light and getting a lot of attention on the site, uh, including our attention. And so we're very grateful for that. And here's a bit of an example of what's been found out there. And so again, you know, it's only been excavated uh, very lightly in recent years, and it's now owned by the Conservation Fund, who acquired a very large uh, number of acres to protect forest land or, or to make sure it's in sustainable forestry. So we're very excited because they want us to own the site. Uh, it's about 100 acres. And so right now we're trying to hammer out the details of how are we going to do that? What's it going to look like? Um, 100 acres isn't cheap, even if it is forest land. So we're going to have to do some fundraising in addition to figuring out how exactly are we going to maintain and protect a site that has very visible ruins and is spread out over a large area. So uh, we're continuing to figure out those details. So stay tuned, keep an eye out for this one. It's a really exciting project. And then finally, I wanted to give a shout out to April. We have a virtual tour video coming up for the Shero site. Uh, this is a great site in central Maine. It's an archaic site dating back to about 10,000 years before the common area era. And we had to go do some excavations up there this summer in advance of a bridge replacement that's going to take place. So we had a little bit of mitigation work to do in the right of way. And it's just an unusual chance to see this site, see some of the excavations and actions. So keep an eye out on our YouTube and social media and all of that, um, because hopefully it'll be out before too long. So um, thanks so much again for all of your support with everything. Um, you know, it means a lot to see just how many people care about this type of thing, because of course all of us care a lot about it ourselves, uh, but to have those connections with our members is very, very meaningful. So thank you so much for supporting our ongoing work. Thank you, Kelly. That was wonderful. And um, we'll move on to Jim, who's going to give us. Uh, well, at first, I want to see if there's any questions from any of our attendees before we conclude. Um, so you're welcome to type them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll give you a minute. Um, see if there's any questions. Hey, April. Yes. 
I noticed one on Facebook. Oh, okay. I think it was asking if some if after we acquire a site, if some of the indigenous people are still have access. I remember seeing that too. So Jim, do you want to tackle that? Yes. Um, let's see. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> Yes, we uh, uh, in the Southwest region uh, take special steps to ensure that indigenous people and descendant communities do have access to the archeological preserves that we control. Uh, and we have sort of a special way of doing this. Our liability insurance uh, company insists that if anyone is visiting an archeological preserve, uh, they must be with either a trained site steward or with uh, a conservancy employee. And this makes it a little awkward if you're uh, part of a descended community and you want to go on to one of our preserves and meditate. So what we've worked out in the Southwest region uh, is that the uh, site steward or employee uh, would open the gates, let you in, and then leave you alone uh, with the understanding that uh, you won't disturb anything uh, on the preserve. And uh, this has worked out very well. And we've had a number of uh, descendant community members who have taken advantage of this and who go back and visit these places on a regular basis. And so uh, that, that has worked out very well. And uh, we realized that, you know, the, the past doesn't belong to the landowner. Uh, the past doesn't belong to the conservancy. It doesn't belong to, you know, the United States. It belongs to all of us. And uh, I think that we strive to share what we've given the responsibility of taking care of and at the same time, let everyone have an opportunity to enjoy, appreciate, uh, meditate, and uh, really see the past in their own way. And so uh, that's what we do in the Southwest, and it's upon request. The same in the Southeast also. If I'm contacted, I've, we always make arrangements for, for members of descendant communities to have access to the sites. I did that with a site in Alabama just recently. And um, so, yeah, that, that's important. Thank you, Jim. Um, Let's see here. We had a question in the Q&A, and I think it's for Kelly here. She answered it. Do you want to cover it um, verbally, Kelly? Yeah. Sure, okay. sure. Uh, and I'll say, too, just briefly, in the eastern region, we have the same policy for permitting Native American access on our preserves as well. So always happy to do that. Um, the question that was in the Q&A was if the Jewish community was Sephardic. And so uh, Sephardic Jews predominantly were from the Iberian Peninsula, I believe, um, but this community would have been an Ashkenazi community. So the Jews who settled at this site were from Western Russia. Um, there was a gentleman named Baron von Hirsch, he was a Jewish gentleman, who actually sponsored resettlement of a lot of Jewish communities located in Western Russia, or yeah, Western Russia and Eastern Europe uh, who were facing persecution. So uh, this was one of those communities. So it was a community of Western Russian Jews who were, were Ashkenazi. Thank you, Kelly. Um, it looks like we have a question in the chat. It says, have, you all, have we dealt with historical or sacred sites dealing with ancestral waters? Example, waterway is not, basically, is there what has we had a site that had any water involved that would have needed uh, regular access by ancestral communities, I think is what they're asking. 
Mm, not in my region that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, I think we, I haven't been presented with uh, that issue in the Southwest region, uh, but I believe we would treat it the same way we treat access to the preserve. And that is that if uh, I was approached by someone, they said, gee, I would really like to have access to this spring, uh, that we would make accommodations to uh, give them access to that particular spring. Great, it looks like that's all the questions that I see at the moment. Um, so, um, Jen, would you like to conclude the event with for us? Sure. Okay. Well, I would like to, uh, again, thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we love sharing these uh, accomplishments with you, our members. And, uh, you know, in many ways, we work for you because you are the driving force behind the conservancy. Uh, you are the, the gas that keeps the car running. And uh, we would really like to hear from you. Uh, if you know of significant sites uh, that are on private land that you think should be preserved and protected, please let us know. And uh, we would be happy to look into it and see what we can do. Uh, the other thing that I might say is that if you own significant archaeological sites on property uh, and you would be very interested in looking at the possibility of extending that protection into the future, uh, then we would be happy to talk to you about that as well. Uh, so please feel free to contact us. We love talking to members. Uh, we would really like to see your ideas and suggestions. And again, thank you for your continued support of the Archaeological Conservancy. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. And thank you all for coming and being a part of our special Giving Tuesday presentation. Um, and again, I'll remind you, um, please visit um, our online campaign and consider a donation today. So have a great day, everyone.